Chapter 10. Abnormal Normal. Urzua had been realistic with his men from the start, and the authorities decided to do the same. The trapped miners were given the real timeline, with rescue a very long way off. Although there were some 250 mental health experts on hand to help the men, to everyone's relief, the bad news did not upset them. Instead, they took up the next challenge with the same spirit they had used to fend off fear and hunger. Now they would have to settle in, into life underground. The men understood that they were going to have to live as moles longer than any human beings had ha, ever had, for months on end, so they needed to turn their burrow into a kind of home. The NASA team had one initial suggestion for how to achieve that. Edison Pena's grid of generators and lamps had given his fellow miners some light, but the space experts had a new idea. The beams could be turned off on and off in 16 and 8 hour shifts that would stimulate day and night. The day would neatly, was neatly divided into thirds, 8 hours of sleep, 8 hours of free time, 8 hours of work, and there was plenty to, of work to do. The doves rushing up and back brought enough food to have breakfast at 8.30, a snack two hours later, lunch at 1, and another bite at 5.30 before a full dinner at 9, a normal schedule for the men. In order to keep to the timetable, a three, three-man three delivery team had to meet the doves as they landed, quickly offload the next meal and pass it along. After every meal, another group cleaned up carefully, separating plastic from food like any good recycler, but also to keep their living space clean and free of, and free of germs as possible. After breakfast, the men loaded up on uh, loaded up a bulldozer to drive to an underground waterfall so they could shower. No one wanted to test NASA's careful calendar of when body odor reaches its peak, or a dandruff begins to cascade from unwashed hair, like snow in winter. Now that they had light and contact with the outside world, the men could spread out in the mine. They did not need to remain clustered near the shelter, as they needed to, and they needed to move. Any drill that cut through the earth toward them would necessarily send rock debris and water, which is used as part of the drilling process, flooding down the shaft. While the miners organized work crews to clear away the rock, the men needed to shift their eating and sleeping areas away from the mud and muck. Urzua used his mapping skills to figure out how the men could make best use of the mine, setting up one room for games and recreation, another as a chapel for prayer, and a small space on the side and out of sight for the newly established phone line. The miners would need privacy, so no one would see them crying when they spoke to their families. Getting back to normal came in many ways. Pena was a runner. By the time the miners made contact with the drillers, moving was the furthest thing from his mind. Weak, hungry, and waiting for death, he had curled up into a little ball, like a baby. But now that he was eating again and feeling better, he began training. He found a way to cut down his heavy boots so he reached just his ankles and set out. I ran to forget I was trapped, he later said. I ran in the dark. I ran to the depths, the lowest of the low, but I kept running. Soon he was strong enough to cover some five miles a day. As Pena ran, he kept singing, Return to Sender, a song by his hero Elvis Presley. I was saying to that mine, I can outrun you. I'm going to run until you're tired and bored of me. And I did it. Dr. Mike Duncan, the leader of the NASA team, spoke with the miners by spone, his broken English only lasting, though, lasting through. Como estas? Bien. Before a translator had to help out. Duncan was just one of many topside people who began sending encouragement down the mine. Thursday, September 2nd, brought bad and good news. The Strata 950 was moving so slowly it had gotten down to only about 130 feet, and worse, it would have to pause. Geologists had found a fault in the rock that made drilling dangerous. The rescue timeline now surely stretched out months ahead. But the doves carried a special gift, prayer beads and rosaries, blessed by the Pope and sent directly from Rome. For the miners, those who had been religious before the accident, as well as those whose faith grew down in the mine, this was a powerful form of blessing. On September 4th, four people who had survived that terrible plane crash in the, on, in the Andes in 1972 arrived. Remain united and together, one urged the men. And then, looking ahead to life after their final rescue, the four offered some financial advice. Don't give away too much. They knew from their own experience that there would soon be a scramble to publish books and film movies about the miracle of Chile. If everything continued to go well and the miners got home safely, the disaster that very nearly took their lives would be their ticket to fame, and, very likely, fortune. To round out the string of lights on September 8th, the South Korean technology giant Samsung sent a new product, a cell phone that included a tiny projector preloaded with a message from President Panero, and more important, the Chile-Ukraine soccer match. More than 2,000 feet below ground, flickering on the rock well, were the sights and sounds of the game so many of the miners wanted to see. 
In turn, a fiber optic cable beamed images of Franklin Lobos and the other miners watching the game back out to the nation. To Franklin Lobos, a special hello, said the game announcer, completing the loop of mine of game, mine, and game. August 25th on Topside. The mood of weird normal normalcy down in the mine was matched up in the camp. Every evening at 6, family members gathered in a larger tent to hear reports on the progress of the drilling, the condition of the men, and the timeline stretching ahead. The NASA team arrived and was impressed at what they saw. The top leaders of the rescue, from government ministers to local officials, were all there to make sure the families had the most direct and current information. Looking at the packed tent of 80 or so seated women and standing men, Dr. Holland could see the concern on their faces. Yes, they were miners' families, but usually, if there was an accident, a man either died or came back quickly. This long wait was different. Bundled up against the nighttime cold, wearing clothes that hinted at hard lives, the families showed their needs. But Dr. Harlan, Holland also felt something else, a bond linking everyone there. When a little child scrambled up, anyone might take his or her hand, from the highest official to the closest grandmother. Together, they would get through this together. He had noticed that when Dr. Itira spoke to the miners, the Chilean doctor expressed more feeling than was common, at least in his own Texan background. So when he spoke through an interpreter, he was eager to show he was not some outsider throwing his weight around, telling them what to do. He was there because their government had invited him, and he would offer what he could. Dr. Holland gave the families a sense of what he saw in their faces. He could feel that they were having a hard time. To this day, when he speaks about that moment, his voice cracks. But, he explained, they were on a mission of their own, just like the miners. The families had as important a play to, part to play in the rescue as anyone else. Their spirit, their encouragement, their support was a lifeline for the trapped men. He asked the families to have faith, not just a religious faith, but also a trust in the team that was working to rescue the men. And finally, he urged them to realize that nothing was going to happen quickly. The rescue was going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And so he urged some of them to go home and to leave one family member on site while letting others return to work or school to their regular lives. The families liked that suggestion, and soon the camp shrank until the weekends. Then everyone flooded back, eager to share mail, calls, and video conferences with the men. The little tent city had showers, kitchens, and scheduled concerts by visiting entertainers. For a while, the press had been allowed to mingle with families, but now there were too many reporters. The rescue site was divided into rings. Camp Hope for the Families, just two documentary makers, Nova and Discovery, and the drilling area was only for specialists. That left an ever-growing circle for the media, reporters, photographers, TV crews, including five from Japan alone, and film directors getting the feel of the location. The British Broadcasting Corporation sent some 25 people to the site and recruited Marcella, Marcella Zemina, and Omar, all grown children of Omar Regeas, one of the trapped men to keep diaries. Their entries trace the same events that we had just seen 2,000 feet down. On August 31st, Marcella was worried about the muddy conditions in the mine until she learned that the men were moving. On September 1st, Omar wrote that his dad was craving his favorite food, steak with lots of avocado. But as the men got healthy enough to eat just about anything, the rescuers faced a new problem. The capsule was going to be tight, so the miners were going to have to watch their waistlines. Ironically, men who had been starving, wasting away, now had to be sure to avoid getting fat. On September 5th, Omar met with the four famous survivors of the 1972 crash. They assured the families that the miners will get out of there stronger than ever before. Zamina reported that once a week at exactly 2.30 in the afternoon, the moment of the initial rock collapse, everyone drove around honking their horns and blowing whistles, both marking the instant when the earth grabbed the men and chasing it away, defeating it. Two days later, Zamina got to talk with her father by video conference. Our mission, she wrote, is to give him lots of hope. Her father wanted pictures of his children and grandchildren, but also had a more practical request. He needed plastic bags so that he could sort out his underwear and keep it dry. Indeed, so many presents were rushing down to the men that the families needed to keep up. After all, united as they were in the mine, the men rooted for soccer teams that were arch rivals. The guys who rooted for the University of Chile soccer team were bragging about their team. So Zamina sent down the flag of Colo Colo, Omar's favorite squad.